So hi, welcome to a new social contract. Um, and at a perfect time when we are also in the next week going to embrace the fall equinox. And so we're bringing in not just a new season, but a new way that we want the world to look, it, to look like. And so in true Black Women blue, um, Blueprint style, we're gonna open up today's um, discussion with an affirmation, bringing in our ancestors, some prayer, and just really grounding into a past that has a story of both trauma and resiliency that has brought us here, yeah? So my name is Dee. I'm not gonna talk about myself because what's important is what I'm gonna say. Um, and so I'm gonna ask, I don't know if the Schomburg is uh, listening, but I'm gonna ask maybe for some lights um, to dim down. Is that okay? Can we have some lights dim down? And I'm gonna ask everybody to uh, stop shuffling and to maybe put your phones down or anything that is on your lap. Not the kids, not the kids. <laughs> and I just wanna uh, take us on a little journey, taking a deep breath so that we can settle and ground ourselves into this conversation, but to bring ourselves into the present moment. So I'm gonna ask everybody to take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just listen. Take a deep breath in. Letting go of everything that you had to do to get here. And exhaling. Taking another deep breath in. And letting go of everything you need to do once this is over. Dear fall, goddess of change, of the autumn full moon, hear our call. We call for courage and strength and power from below, from within and above, as we stand in doubt at the crossroads of our lives, of our movements, and of this world. Help us move forward without pain and strife, but with peace and ease. Support us in letting go of the past and of old dreams of what this world should look like. We lift our faces to the moon to see the unseen, to ask our ancestors for guidance in our struggle. We ask you for illumination and safety on this journey. We know that it will only be when we see with our third eye, our intuition, our humanity, and humanity in everyone around us that we will be able to create tomorrow, that we will be able to surrender to love, to forgive each other and ourselves. I acknowledge our ancestors who have supported our divine and higher purpose. I ask them to come into this room, so if you have anyone that you know cannot be here with you today, anybody who guides you in your work, you can call out their name. We ask them to join us, to walk with us this fall so that women and children and families can tap into their royalty because fall is about standing in our power. Our efforts will not go unseen and we will be guided by the winds of change into a spiritual, evolutionary, revolutionary awakening. We are one with the universe and as such we have faith that we will connect to our higher power and continue to do the universe's work. I'm gonna ask everybody to take a deep breath in, inhaling safety and exhaling any threat of danger that you are carrying with you. Take another deep breath in, inhaling power and exhaling any sense of powerlessness that may live within you. Take another deep breath in, inhaling freedom, and exhaling any sense of bondage or anything that you are attached to that's keeping you. Take another deep breath in, inhaling serenity, and exhaling any sense of doubt of you, your work, what you're up to, or what is possible on this earth. And lastly, take a deep breath in and inhale love. 
letting go of any fear of what dreaming can be, any anger, any resentment, any shame, any guilt, and anything that keeps you a prisoner to yourself. Take another deep breath in and find any tense spots within you. Relax your shoulders. Relax your jaw. And welcome to another world. And slowly bring yourself back into this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you all here to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. My name is Katie Atu Tubman, and I'm the, I manage education programs here at the Schomburg. And it's my privilege to welcome this amazing panel of um, strong women, brilliant women, who are here to talk about issues that pertain to so many of us across this country and this world. And so I really appreciate you all being here on this Wednesday evening. And I just want to, I was, we were gonna show a Schomburg video, get all fancy, but I feel like y'all are just ready to jump right in, right? Yeah, we've been here too long. I've been here since nine o'clock. <laughs> and I think, of course, a lot of us do know uh, Arturo Schomburg and know of his legacy and the namesake of this building and why it's so important to call him into this space. But for this conversation, I really, I took time to reflect and thought about who I really wanted to call into this space. My ancestors, my namesake, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Audre Lorde, uh, I have so, I can go on and on. But I want to also bring into the space Jean Blackwell Hudson, many of wh whom are not familiar with. One of the leading figures behind the Schomburg Center, she expanded our resources our archives to what it is today. She was the soul and heart of this institution. And often, like many of us, for us, black women and women of color, that labor, that love, that intentionality goes unnoticed and unheard of. And so I just wanted to call her into this space because all of this is a result of her work and her legacy. And so today's conversation surrounds much of that, about the work we need to do as black women, as Latinx women, as women of color, and women who want to see a better world and future through the archives, through our schools, in our homes, in our communities, in politics, government, finance, everywhere, because we deserve it and we are worthy of it. And so I don't want to take up too much time, but I do want to introduce our amazing panel from our, is it my right or your left? Oh, no. I was learned that in elementary school I struggled, so I'm gonna just start here with Kathy. <laughs> so this is Kathy. Everyone give it up for Kathy. Thank you so much. I was approached by Kathy and Farah for this amazing event. I'm glad to be able to put it on. Kathy joins us from, let me read this real quick, the National Economic Social Rights Initiative. Next we have Farah Tanis. Farah! I do have a quick story for y'all. I met Farah, I've been a huge fan of the Black Women's Blueprint for years. Give it up to Black Women Blueprint. And I met Farah on the street, I think it was a couple of months ago on a, a, for a protest for the TPS, and my sister dragged me out there because she's a journalist, and she was like, let's stand in the, in the snow and, and cold and speak to people who are, who are doing this amazing work. And then we ran into fair. She was out there with these young people, and I was just like, oh my goodness, this is the moment I've been waiting for. So I'm so glad to have you here today, Farah. <laughs> Next, we have Jacqueline Evanks from the Commission on Gender and Equity from the Mayor's Office. Thank you for being here, Jacqueline. Akiba Solomon from Color Lines. Color Lines, I've been reading that for like 10 years. I'm a subscriber, remember that? <laughs> and last but not least, hold on one sorry, I'm sorry, my list is getting smaller. <laughs> A cute, who am I gonna say? Oh, there we go, I have Genesis. Genesis, how are you? So Genesis, unfortunately, you're not on my list, but tell us where, you come, where you're joining us from. There we go, Black Women's Blueprint, there we go. My apologies, this list, 
Sorry, what's, yes. Y'all, this list is long, so forgive me. <laughs> so who is it? Kathy, yeah, your mic's on. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one of our insurgent candidates who came up against the machine as she describes it and the race is, 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 was very close so it's still unsettled and they're waiting for the absentee ballots and, yes. and the affidavits. So let's wish so Genesis is amazing. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Genesis. And so we'll have an amazing conversation moderated here on stage. Afterwards, we will open up a conversation and, and we really want to make sure this space is not just us talking at you or this panel talking at you. It's going to be an inclusive conversation. So we will also have microphones in the back of the room. If you're not able to physically stand up, just raise your hand if you have a question or a comment and we'll come around with the microphones. But there will be a time, a brief period, where you all are allowed to engage with the audience. So I'll actually give it away right now. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm just going to uh, introduce the conversation, and then uh, from then on, I'll just be asking questions. Uh, so welcome. We thank you for joining this conversation. We are here because we need a conversation about a new social contract. We can start by just asking ourselves, what does that even mean, just to make sure we're all starting from the same page. And a new social contract for us is just the basic assumptions that we all make about what we owe each other, what our rights are, what our democracy should look like, what our systems, how our systems should be defined. What are those assumptions that in a sense form the story we tell ourselves about who we are and the story we tell each other about who we are? Because we know we have never had a social contract that treats black and Latinx women with the dignity and the respect that we deserve, we need this conversation. And for those of you who are, this woman having that question, yes, Latinx women are black, they are indigenous, they are mulata, mestiza, trigueña, all mixed race identities, as well as Asian and white. But we have had, the majority of us, significant unifying experiences in this country that, that have informed our view that we need this conversation. We need this conversation because black millions of black and Latino women have woken up today and will wake up tomorrow, not only in poverty, but in extreme poverty, which means they will have approximately $250 or less per child to take care of a month's necessities. $250 per person in a household is extreme poverty, and there are literally millions of people in it, the vast majority black and Latino women and their children. $250 is two Metro cards, people. So how do you feed, house, and care for a child at that level of poverty? And the fact that it is disproportionately, by a large share, black and Latino women who are in the worst forms of poverty is not an accident. It has a lot to do with race, and it has a lot to do with gender. So we need this conversation, because we know that even when things were better, they were never right. They're getting worse, but they were never right. We are in a moment of political chaos, but that is both a problem, obviously it's posing severe problems, and it's an opportunity. I like to think of it as a proportunity <laughs> because change will come. It has become unsustainable. The question becomes, what kind of change? This project argues that we need to revision our social contract to design one that is actually driven by human-centered human rights values, that is grounded in systems, universal systems that actually serve everyone, community models that serve everyone, not the systems we have now that fragment, tear, divide, and abandon so many of us. It also argues that we need new forms of democracy. We need to rethink democracy so that we have the power to advance more proactive and different solutions that can improve our lives. And we asked ourselves, where do you start? How do you begin that change? We believe 
that communities that have been at the front line of injustice have come up with a whole range of very creative solutions that are the seeds of that change, if not more. And that we can change all kinds of sectors from public goods and services, land and housing and energy, finance and banking, labor, local democracy, that it is communities that have been struggling against injustice that have the most creative insights as to what that needs to look like. We encourage you to take a look at the publication that uh, you can download on our website at www.nesri.org. And uh, I would just, the last comment I'll make is that these, this business of larger change is the business of black and Latinx women not just the business of more dominant communities or not just the business of men, and not only because black and Latinx women suffer the burden so disproportionately, but if you look at the leadership that has been emerging across the nation, the insurgent leadership that is calling for genuine change, if you think about your favorite race this year, there's a higher probability this year that you might be thinking about a black and Latinx woman than you, than you ever have before. We have the possibility of sending more women of color to Congress in this year than we ever have. So this is our conversation, and I am going to sit down and begin it with these amazing women here. Which means I have to switch the mic. And I am gonna start with you, Farah, although I encourage people to, to jump in. Um, so. What drew you, Farah, just to start us off? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when the project was launched, you, you reached out mm -hmm. and you said, uh, we're very interested in this. We're very excited about this. We really think this is the way our organizing should go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was it about the project and what was it about the story that was told in the project about our history that, that drew you to moving in this direction? You're using yours, I'm using mine. Yeah, we're all. <laughs> Greetings, family. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question, like what drew me to the work. I feel like it's one that can't, I can't pinpoint a specific moment. I think there's something that I've always been waiting for. I'm always waiting for something, and my staff knows this. We're always waiting for that moment. We're always waiting for, you know, this, this, the opportunities uh, um, that will allow us to deploy our power. But I will say this, and I will tell you a little bit, just give you a little slice of my story. Uh, I am an, am an immigrant from Haiti. I came here when I was, <laughs> hey, <laughs> um, immigrant from Haiti, uh, came here when I was nine years old with my family. And you know, when I was reading the new social contract, it took me back to this place, and it took me back, especially when we were talking about the history, when I was reading about the history of African Americans in this country, right? I said to myself, we came in to a new social contract, but we, we came into an old social contract that was failing, a broken social contract, but we're also coming from a broken social contract, right? When you think about the places from which we all come, we're talking about black folks, we're talking about Latinx folks, and we're, we, we're not monolithic, right? We're all from different places and come from very different contexts, but there is an exploitation and extortion of assets that we've all experienced and that we can all feel and that we can, we've all lived. And so that slice of my story is just really coming to the United States and remembering, turning the lights on, and knowing what poverty means, right? And I ask this question all the time, thinking back to my own life and my own childhood, what does poverty mean to me? And poverty to me means turning the light on in my kitchen and seeing roaches scattered, right? Scatter from, from cornflakes boxes. Some of us know this, right? Some of us are cringing, but many of us know what that looks like, what it means to scrub the floor with ammonia and scrub the walls bare and wash the dishes every night and clean your oven with that, you know, those fumes. What's, what was what, what it called? Easy off. <laughs> right, you know, easy off. 
But still, poverty crawled and creeped up through the floorboards and under the doors, right? And you can hear it outside your bedroom window with sirens, right? And you can hear it in the shouts outside, people screaming at each other. And so having lived and having experienced that as a child, and then reading about the history of this social contract that was meant to bring everyone along and that was meant to equal the playing field economically and that was meant to provide housing, that was meant to ensure the right to economic security for everyone in this country. Reading that really opened my eyes even further to what I had already known, you know, was a, a, a fundamental problem with the fact that so many of us, and especially those of us of, of, of color, you know, did not have the same access from what they call, they say what, from the cr cradle to, to the pri to prison, or from, the sex from sexual abuse to, to the prison pipeline, right? Many of us don't have that, the, the, that access that others have. And so my interest comes from a very personal place, and it also comes from working with women and organizing with women and LGBTQ folks who talk about what poverty means to them, that poverty means engaging in certain types of work, you know, that if there were other choices that they would make, and some make those choices and we respect them, poverty means having to fight for what it is they believe in and what it is that they do. And so that is part of what attracted me um, to this work, just a part of it. The new social contract really just solidified for me that we need a new social contract. This is the avenue we've been looking for. We've been practicing it already through solidarity economy. And so that, um, I hope that answers at least the question of what is it that intrigued me and, and, and interested me in, in coming to this and, and, and wanting to read more and know more and see what we can do to build that ourselves. Let me, um you can clap, it's allowed. Let me, let me uh, toss you the next one, Akiba. Let, and let's talk about this, this notion, um, both in our narrative and in our previous sort of 20th century policy framework of the inevitability of poverty. We know that our, our, our national policy is to keep us at unemployment at 4%. That's, that's a matter of policy. We know that the last social contract was supposed to ameliorate policy and provide a basic safety net, excluding many people, nonetheless. And the narrative has been that's the best we can do, right? Be reasonable, and that's what got us here. So as a journalist and someone who's sort of seeped in culture, um, what role do you think the media plays in enabling us to open or not open sort of our political imaginations to think about these things differently. Thank you for that question, and I'm so happy to be here. I feel honored, thank you for having me here. Um, what I'll say about media, media is a funny animal because uh, media is made up of people, right? But the fiction around media is that there is a level of objectivity, and people use objectivity to uphold white supremacy. When you start with a system that is uh, in deference and complete construction of whiteness and white supremacy, you can't be objective. What you're gonna do is you're gonna work against narratives that actually uh, deconstruct that. And so I say all that to say, media can be extremely uncreative when it comes to creating narratives. Media, a lot of mass media, and this has changed to a certain extent because there's so much independent media and there's so much digital media. But overall, if you look at television, if you read major newspapers, if you listen even to like podcasts and these sorts of things, there are a couple of core ideas that media will say that they think we're addicted to and they lack imagination. So one of those things is this will go over everybody's head. They don't understand it. That's how you dumb down and you make things that are really clear, like a new social contract. When you start talking about something where you assemble a group of people to harness their power and flex it, that's not hard to understand. But media will say, that's really complicated because nobody understood labor in 1940. Okay, you don't have to do that, right? 
if you were a better writer and a more inventive person and you knew how to ask questions, then this wouldn't really be difficult. I think the other thing that comes up in the lack of imagination is that media wants to rely on people who give the best sound bites. And the way that you create sound bites a lot of times is to repeat what the script already is and just do it in a supposedly exciting way. So I'm not gonna like continue to lecture everybody on communications theory, but I just wanna stop with this. You know, last night, uh, D.L. Hughley, who I am not a fan of, <laughs> um, he, he, he has a new Netflix special. And you know, he's always been problematic, but um, I've actually never like sat down and really listened to him. And so one of the things that he said, he said two things. One thing he said was, that Me Too has made it impossible for men to know what to say to women. Now, we've heard this a million and one times, right? Like, we've heard it from um, highly conservative people, we've heard it from, you know, sort of cis, uh, rich white men in power, we've heard it from Les Monvy, we've heard it from folks like that. But then we have D.L. Hughley, who's in an a auditorium full of black folks, and he's repeating that. And the the special's called Contrarian, as if he's saying something that's original. So that's number one. The other thing that he said that was really disturbing was he was talking about how uh, Trump wants to throw Mexicans out of the country. Okay, so fine, whatever. Like, we're going to start with that. And he was like, but who will we have to pick our strawberries? And then he said, because black folks don't want to work outside anymore. We already did that. So if, if we want strawberries, the Mexicans are going to have to harvest them. That is unacceptable, right? It's unacceptable. He said it in a predominantly black setting. There was clearly a laugh track. Everybody laughed, you know, on time. He posits himself as a truth teller, but all he's doing is repeating the same white supremacist script as everybody else. And so I think, you know, D.L. Hughley, who's more likely to be on D.L. Hughley? Is it Baratanis? Who's, go who's, who's, who's gonna be on uh, Bill Maher? Who's gonna be on CNN? It's not gonna be Farah. You know, it's not gonna be Genesis. It's gonna be D.L. Hughley. So that's where I think media fails. And I think that there are opportunities in media as more of us actually join the field and stay in it. But I think the folks who understand this need to make other people understand and also understand that there's not a crisis of imagination and there's no dearth of actual ideas. It's just up to people to take the responsibility to figure out who to talk to and how to deliver it to a group of people so that they can make decisions on their own. That's right. So moving from media, <laughs> media as not the solution, to government, Jackie, um, I'm going to to direct the next one at you. We um, when we when we spoke on the phone, we talked about uh, a number of things, but one of them was you felt strongly, as would befit someone in government, that we need to build up the public, right, and that we need to build it up differently, differently from the way the media seems to think is possible. And when we said, well, we were the project is pushing universal solutions. Uh, I'll, I, I left out of my intro, Latinx communities also include white people and Asians, it's a multi, multiracial community, meant to note that, but you said, you know, these solutions really are better for everyone, and it's important to note they would be better for poor white folks too, from where you sit. Um, and one of the, and I just want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what the commission is concerned about, I know you're, talk, you're really focused on unpaid work and underpaid work for caretaking that's very gendered. How do you see universal solutions to those structural problems? How does it relate to the full range of communities that you referred to in our conversation? Well, thank you so much for that question and for the opportunity to be here tonight. As somebody who has just completed her first year like full-time in city government, and um, as an immigrant, I spend a lot of time thinking how fortunate it is to work in New York City in this multi-ethnic, um, just wonderful experimentation of partnership, of collaboration. We often don't see it that way. 
But I think because of the diversity in New York, because New York is this truly global local community, um, we have an incredible opportunity as government to create new approaches to addressing old and seemingly intractable challenges. When I got the opportunity to, um, to apply for this job and then to take it, one of the things that impressed me most was that the commission is now called the Commission on Gender Equity. Its predecessor commissions are the Commission on the Status of Women and the Commission on Women's Issues. And those are sort of amorphous. One's really the status of women, nowhere status. And then the other is just issues, right? What I loved about this, the new name that this administration created is one, it is very contemporary. It is breaking us out of a binary construct of gender. And so when we talk about our work, we say we work to support girls, women, transgender, and gender non-conforming individuals. What is of paramount importance is that we, we use this opportunity to bring all excluded persons forward. We also use the opportunity to bring informed men forward. We bring this opportunity to learn to talk to each other so that, and yes, there are some men who really don't know what to do with Me Too, and maybe they are rightly scared, but it's important to hear that narrative because it isn't invalid. It may not be what we think, but the question is how do I address that so that we bring this individual, if he is so inclined, to growth? and learning and partnership. As being a part of a government entity, and when we talk about equity, it's the, it's the process as well as a destination, right? We want to create a parallel opportunity, great opportunity for economic mobility and opportunity for all New Yorkers. We want to ensure that all New Yorkers have full autonomy over their reproductive lives. We want to ensure that we have access to quality and affordable health care. And we want to ensure that we live safely in our homes and in our communities, regardless of our gender identity or gender expression. So how do we get there? And the challenge for us in New York City is to make sure, and we have taken this on, that we become a best-in-class employer, that those who work for the city can experience equity as employees. And also that we become a best-in-class municipal government as far as it relates to developing gender equitable policies and practices, right? How we serve the community. Key to this, we like to say on the commission that there are four ways we, we try to achieve change. And no doubt, this is a cultural change. This is how do we look differently? How do we behave differently? How do we operate in an inclusionary manner consistently so that the benefits are in order to all New Yorkers? So we believe you have to create policy and legislative change. You also have to foster what we call interagency collaboration, that city agencies need to work together. How do we break the silos? Equally important, we have to fashion cross-sector collaboration. That the change we seek happens in government, it happens in the nonprofit sector, it happens in the for-profit sector, and although philanthropy is not a sector, I want to talk about philanthropy and place that at the table as they, can, they manage incredible wealth, okay? And that's access to resources. We also believe in data, qualitative, and quantitative, working together. How that gets generated is another debate, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and last but not least, which is, this is for me the tipping point, we have to have public engagement. We have to foster constant dialogue. We're getting into the very roots of community and hearing from community. And this is why I so value this discussion today, 
because the term new social contract seems grandiose, but we're really at a critical period of change in society, a period in which our democracy kind of has probably reached its a critical plateau. How do we bring government, the individual, the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector into the game together so that we benefit all people? That's the challenge. And the other thing to recognize is once we have achieved a new level, the work isn't done. I think we get lazy as a people. At a, and, and it's not just individuals. It's, there's a psychological drain in driving change. And that energy dissipates. How do we constantly keep this moving so that we advance all peoples? Uh, I'll stop there. Actually, I'll ask you to, to follow up on one thing you said. You talked about, you, you said two different things, actually. At one point, you said, hear from community. And at another point, you said, bring community into government, which is a different, a slightly different framing. So I wanted to ask you, what do you see as some of the most promising strategies to get beyond, to get from just hearing to actually having communities that have been excluded be able to exert more power into how government functions? You know, for me, it's, it's the idea of listening to community, to have community inform mm -hmm. and recognize that once community informs, we act on the information. So one of the things we spend a lot of time doing in, in the city, it's either we convene round tables or I'm engaged in a process now where we are focused on 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, that campaign, which is global, but the United States never participates in it. And uh, we're determined in our bucket of safety that we want community to articulate how we remain safe in our homes, in our schools, at work, and in our streets. And so we're holding information sessions borrow by borrow. And we're documenting that. And through that, we're creating, based on the feedback, we're asking nonprofits to create events in community districts over that 16 days. So we're giving the ownership to author the change to community. We as a city, we are supporting that work through where we can talk about scale and promote and communicate. And then we're learning from it as it happens. I don't think there is any one solution. It, for me, it's about how do you foster interaction to the extent that everyone feels they are heard and can contribute to the conversation. And that may seem lofty, it's extremely difficult. I do think we have, a, have to have a discipline and a commitment to bringing multiple voices to the table and ensuring that they are heard. Let me, let me move over to you, Genesis, because you, you were running um, for that position because you know, your view is you need, that there needs to be a change in the machine, change in leadership. And you are part of a, a slew of, of new emerging leaders who believe both in building the public, building community, and bringing um, more power to communities in terms of how government functions. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what, why you thought this was the avenue for you to make that contribution, and, and a little bit about the things you've been working on that you think you can bring to government. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I ran for the first time uh, for the district leader position or state committee, and that's how it's called in Brooklyn. And one of the main reasons why I, I ran is because I learned that my district was the, had the least representation in Brooklyn. Uh, out of 192 seats, we only have about 30 or 29 occupied seats in the Brooklyn Democratic Party. Um, so to me, that was surprising uh, and disgusting at the same time. And then I learned that it's just common in Brooklyn. Uh, the Brooklyn Democratic Party has about 3,000 seats, and only about 300 have been occupied. Uh, and a lot of those 300 don't even go to the meeting. Some of them are dead. If you go and read that in the New York, <laughs> if you read it in the New York Times, it's the same thing in the Bronx, the same thing in Southern Ireland. So I, <clears throat> I decided to run because I thought. 
the system theoretically has been created for it to be democratic, right? So the county committee seats are, six that are supposed to represent each election district, which is like every three or four blocks. And then the state committee, and then the district leader, uh, the assembly district, right? The whole, and then you have an assembly member. Um, per election district, you have about two people, but it doesn't work like that, you know? Um, the seats are empty. So I thought, some, somebody told me, um, you have to occupy the places that belong to you. And that stayed in my mind. And people ask me, you know, to run before, and I'm like, ah, I'm not into that, you know? I'm, I'm more into the activism, but I thought about that. We have to occupy the places that belong to us. Unfortunately, my district has the biggest Mexican density in the city of New York. We have the biggest Chinatown. We also have the biggest public housing project, Red Hook Houses, uh, in Brooklyn. And we, despite that, despite that most of us are people of color, we have about five senators, well, we got rid of some of them, uh, five senators that are, three of them are caucusing with the Republicans and five senators in an assembly district. That is called gerrymandering. Uh, it's crazy. So we are divided completely. We don't have uh, too much. So I, I, I thought that if we, well, my, my campaign was grassroots, right? So we started grassroots. We started, I started talking to neighbors, and I decided to engage them. So we ran about 55 people for the county committee. So now we're going to have, after the primary last Thursday, we have 109 people who are going to be in the county committee. So the, the problem now is not that they just got elected, now is to continue uh, working with them, to continue engaging them, because uh, that way they will be responsible and accountable for their part of the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if I'm derouting from your question. Um, that's, that's, that's basically, I, I just thought it, it, it was important important to, to engage everybody. Uh, the, the Democratic Party doesn't include people like my mother, for example. She has been living in the United States for a long time, uh, about 23 years, but she doesn't speak English. She's a voter, she's a Democrat. Uh, my grandfather has been uh, in this country since, I don't know, since before I was born, about 40, 50 years. Um, and they live in the neighborhood before nobody wanted to live there. And I think they should be included in the process. We have Chinese people, a lot of them, and you know they're not included at all. So I think when you have meetings, they should be close to public transportation. We should have language access. So my campaign started from the basic, basic things, asking for basic things, and that's that's just I think that's real democracy when you include people, and and then you create transparency. Um, the district leaders are the people who nominate, help nominate judges in the Democratic Party, but usually. If you have the same assembly member or the same elected official also holding the same position, then you have less accountability. And then you don't have people in the county committee, you have less people holding you accountable to the judges that you are going to nominate. So that's why we see a, house, a, a crisis in the housing court. Because you see certain judges that doesn't, most of them don't even understand our communities. But uh, it, starts, it starts there. It starts with a, a small position that nobody knows about the county committee members, the judicial delegates, and that's what the campaign did, just create awareness so that people can get engaged and participate from their own space, you know? My mother's a babysitter. She can participate in democracy from her own space. I, I am, you know, more political. I can do it in another way. And that, that was the basis for the campaign. And I think if we start that way, if we do that and replicate that in every part of the city, then we can uh, have a government, like she, um, Jackie was saying, that is inclusive and, and, and engages everybody and includes, you know, community organizations and have um, ability to work between agencies. Well, what, you were your own campaign manager and you told me back there that you were approached by people you might be able to describe as slumlords to offer to fund your campaign that you turned down um, because you suspected that they had certain expectations. Um, what would you change? How, how do you, what would you change about the process and the system so that people can participate from their own space more so that um, you came very close despite all that, right? To, mm -hmm. to challenge a 14 year incumbent. What, what more do we need to change? to tip that balance? I, 
Well, for me, it was, it, it was uh, hard and easy at the same time, right? Because I was running against the machine, uh, and my opponent really was an assembly member. Although I was not directly running against him, but his whole machine came, you know, and tried to take me off the ballot. <laughs> but also means less money, you know? I, I think one of the things that we can change is just taking money out of politics. I think we need uh, campaign laws in the city uh, that, that regulate campaigns, because that way corporations don't have power on the things that you can do. I, one day I was invited to this fundraiser for another candidate who was, when I, was I wasn't even thinking about running. And in the fundraiser, it was full of judges. And then, you know, he's a district leader. And I realized, oh, maybe this is how the judges get appointed. Because it's a, they get appointed in, behind closed doors. Nobody knows how they get appointed. So that, that little space let me know about, okay, this, is, this needs to change. Uh, you cannot have an easy pass because you funded my campaign. So I did, you know, had, I encountered certain people, you know, throughout my campaign that wanted to support, but and I found myself in a hard place because I'm like, ah, oh, we fucking broke. <laughs> 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 we need the money. <laughs> like there was a moment that I was creating my own signs, um, <laughs> and um, and then if you run in a campaign, you want to be, the unions are very critical, you know. You have to print from unions, and they cost triple the amount. Like if you we're printing from a local place that is not, it's not a union. So I think taking money out of campaigns and also, I think the more people are aware of campaign and the more people are engaged in local politics, then the more support you can have, you know? And, and then, you know, regular people like, I don't know, the barbers can support you. I have people, you know, I have people from the bar. My father's, uh, it's not his barber, so where he goes, the barber's where he goes to. Uh, they do, one of them donated two dollars, the other donated five, one of them donated a hundred. Uh, those are small, s small numbers, but they felt motivated for the first time somebody came to them and, you know, they even did a barbecue, a Dominican type of barbecue, like with a lot of <laughs> loud music. But that's okay, I think that's the way people relate to each other and that's the way people should treat politics, uh, like something normal, something part of life, right? Um, that is, I think that's it, you know, people, we just need to have stronger regulations when it comes to to campaigning and corporation funding. Um, and I think that, that has a lot to do of why um, our government has been failing, you know? Um, especially with, when it comes to providing public services. We have seen a decline in the services. Um, and we have moved from a from an industrial, I guess. Uh, I'm talking about my own neighborhood, right? I live in Sunset Park. and. Um, we had we used to have a lot of factories, but now you have Industry City uh, and other big uh, landlords, and we are turning the economy of the neighborhood into a service economy. But that doesn't necessarily benefit the people, right? Because you are employing somebody for short term. Maybe you're not providing self, self the same health insurance. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so the, the more the corporations are involved in the government, the less services you have. You have more, you know, now that we have Trump, he got on um, that guy, Ben Carson, ahead of um, HUD, you know? That means this year they cut a few millions to NYCHA, New York City Bully Housing Authority. Yeah, I think we're, we're all agreed we're not going in the right direction right now. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that, that needs to change. So, so it starts basic, you know, with basic little things from the start, from the campaign. So that way they don't control you when you're up there. Jackie, you, you know, said I want to yeah. jump in, go ahead. I just, I think one of the, with the recent elections, I've really been impressed with the boldness of candidates like yourself who just haven't done it before and went for it. And certainly, the, who could have expected Tuesday night um, or whenever we, Thursday night, the, the idea that I don't remember ever seeing a Democratic primary in New York City this competitive. And that sort of a moment had me rocking. I'm like, whoa, what happened here? And I think, however, there's still more to do. And so we have to each look at ourselves and try to find the way to say yes as women of color 
that we will engage, win or lose, in the political process. And it's probably one of the hardest things, I think, for us as women to do. I know I've, I've been working 30 years in, in, in this city, and I've thought over and over to run for office, and every time I go up, and my answer is, hell no. Um, it, there's just something about the space. But you have to realize, as I have, and I'm not running for office, that if you're not in the game, you can't make the changes you talk about. And so what does it take for us to support each other through that journey? What does it take for us when we are competing against each other? Because that will be new for us. Um, how do you go back, back at it when you lose, right? Um, just thinking about the risks in standing up to lead. And we have a great opportunity in three years because of term limits. Mm -hmm. We now have about 11 women in our city council, uh, which is the lowest That's in a long board. time. And I, several of them, maybe eight or so, are term limited. Um, 80 to 90% of the city council is term limited. So spend some time thinking about what we want. When you talk about a new social contract, what do you want your local municipal elected government to look like? And where do we find and see ourselves? Fortunately for New York City, we have a lot of um, organizations helping women, educating us on how to run for office. I think of Higher Heights. I think of the New America um, Sayu Bajwani's group, New, New, American, um, New American Project. New American Project. Um, you know, we really should just spend some time and see it as an investment in self. The complexity of our system is, um, you know, it, it's, it's complex and it's hidden. And we have to make sure that we make it more visible. So I would really encourage that we follow in Genesis footsteps as best as we can. And if some of us can't run for office, let's figure out how we run campaigns, because that too is important. Being able to, no matter how local it is, it would have been nice if she had a group of individuals to depend on women who, who supported her. So, and I'm sure they were, but we, we need to do more and see ourselves as doing more. Absolutely. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. And you know, I, I, I was just gonna say, you know, we need more and more and more Genesis, right? More Genesis. But one of the things that you said that I wanted to just, you know, I wanted to sit with and address, and I had written this little piece, and I was like, everybody's putting away their papers. And I'm like, you know what? This is a good response to what you said in terms of how do we get the solutions uh, from community? And you said, if you cannot play the game, you cannot make, make change, right? Did I get that right? And my, and our, I Black Women's Blueprint, we don't wanna play the game, right? And if we're gonna play the game, we, we didn't get into this movement to play by the rules, right? The rules that are set for us, the rules that Genesis is talking about, right? When we, about uh, corporations, you know, funding, you know, your, your, your funding campaigns and really having control over what, you know, is done. And then when you think about a new social contract, Genesis is, is the embodiment of how that new social contract you know, how we can bring about that new social contract. All of these, all of these things that we're talking about here. What you said about engaging community and giving community voice in government and to speak with you and to get from community what, you know, to hear from them what they need and to provide that space is one thing. But for us, we don't wanna ask permission and we don't wanna be given the space. The space should already be there. We want to create the space. We don't want to come to the table, right? But this is not, you know, this is not to, yeah, and to go in, back. And, and I'm in total agreement mm -hmm. with you, but, but it's not a either or. It's a right. both and. It's a both and. You know, and. as you try to undo, you know, I was talking to a young woman months ago, and she was, she works in a bank, and she was looking at a, an opportunity to get into the mortgage business. And... Um, and she said to me, you know, I really want to help community. She's Latina, et cetera, and I want to work with the nonprofits, et cetera. And I said, you've got to understand 
that unless you know mm -hmm. how the system works, and it's not just about community, then you are limited in how you can help community. And I really want to say, I'm not talking about this, you know, it's not either or. There, if you're going to dismantle something, you got to know what you're dismantling, okay? You've got to know the hurt it creates. You've got to know the opportunity it creates. Because some of us have, even in this system, had great opportunity and are in leadership. That responsibility mm -hmm. is to transform the system, right? right? That's right. So, but you've got to know what you're pushing against. Right. So I'm not in disagreement with no, you. No, we're not in disagreement. But I want us to understand that this is not an either or game. And I think these false dichotomies is where we get into trouble, mm -hmm. right? Well, Some men in 1776 got up and said, we don't like the way it's done. Jackie, I see Mike's moving over there excited. They want uh -oh. to respond to <laughs> I mean, you know, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting. Um, I mean, for me, sort of narrative-wise, again, um, about how these conversations sometimes shake out. Um, and I think sometimes what happens is that we're having the same conversation using different terms. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think also, there has been so much cynicism in the idea of listening to community, right? You have major candidates who are funded by 3M or whoever who say, I'm going on a listening tour, right? So they go up and they hug people at a diner and then they tell an anecdote that probably isn't true about somebody who made a certain amount and how you feel you know, indebted to her and we need to make life better for her. There's a lack of specificity. And so I think part of like the challenge, and I think we can definitely meet the challenge, is to really like get granular. This isn't the right space to get granular, but I think that like naming, like literally describing what is happening in the room, like what Genesis described, is actually a really powerful tool because aside from the fact that it opens up possibility, it also informs people of what the actual process is. And it is, I mean, as much information as there is out in the world about how these things work is as much information that tells you the opposite and confuses you. Yes. New York politics is ridiculously confusing yes. from where I sit. Yes. Right, and I'm a pretty literate person, mm. but I still am like, I have trouble wrapping my head around some of the quirks. And so I think part of the, like, the power of running is having people who are there even to describe what the process looks like. So like the process of yes, running, but also the process of how you even got involved, which is you went to a fundraiser and you were like, why are the judges running a fundraiser? What is this? So I just feel like that's sort of a, like what you're talking about, Farah, in terms of not asking permission and creating, like creating the buckets or creating the system that you wanna see. And then what you're talking about in terms of engaging people, I think everybody is saying the same thing. And so it's sort of like our jobs to do our own part and like figure out how we can push what um, I think the new social contract is, which I think jives with as much truth as I've ever seen put down on paper, so. Genesee, you were, you wanted to jump in? I saw you yeah, waving just, your mic. She well. mentioned a lot of the things that I wanted to, to say, but I also, Sorry. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was also thinking about the idea of government is nobody's land in some way. I know we have a, history you know, of exclusion to, to people like ourselves. But we also had to put, change the narrative. Who, who, who is the government, you know? Because I think right now we have people who are go governing, uh, you know, uh, the, the administration, and they think the same way. This is not our government. We're gonna take control of it, and we're gonna minimize it, and deregulate everything so that we can do whatever we want. So I think we also had to change that, you know, and say, you know what? This is our government, it's our, and we're gonna put us in there, and we're gonna change it to what we want to be. Um, so I think, you know, I think on, on a lot of that, when, when it comes to sh not asking for permission, you know, and also, you know, creating support, like you were mentioning, because me, when I run, when I even 
when I saw the first group, like five people that I wanted to run, uh, there was this all white man who's not even from my district. And he, and he said, you know, if she dares to run, I'm gonna make sure she gets crushed, you know? And everybody stayed quiet, nobody said nothing. And I got, I got nervous, I got scared, because I'm like, who, 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 I don't have money. I don't, have, I don't even know how to run, first of all. And I decided, you know what, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run, and it was hard, because I didn't have the support around me to teach me, hey, these are the papers that you need to file, this is this. So, yes, you don't ask for permission, but at the same time, we need to um, create, you know? Uh, create our own spaces and, 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 and be part of the government, be part of the government. I think we need to combine both. Because <laughs> the thing is that the, the exclusion is big over there, it's, it's big. Even among our own people uh, that want to stay in control. So don't ask for permission, but be part of it. Because the government, we have to just, unfortunately, uh, right now I think, or at least from the perspective of my campaign, right? It's a small campaign with small donors. We didn't have the, I don't wanna say the word capacity, but the capacity uh, to disconstruct a system that has been in place for over you know, 500 years. Uh, right. At the same time, I decided, you know what? Instead of being an attacker, I'll be part of it and be a defender of my people's rights from within. And, and be, um, uh, what's the word I wanna use? A reformer, you know, a reformer. Because sometimes that's how we get, we get rights. You know, like mm. you were mentioning in your, your commission, the name will change, you know, it's, now it's more inclusive. That, I would say that's a reform. Yeah. It's a reform that maybe thinks mm -hmm. it, is, is, it was made possible by people like yourself or other women or community. Well, before me. Right. Yeah, yeah, but people like yourself, you know, so some people from the, from the yeah, economic community. How does I'm that gonna, trickle gonna, down, though, to economic justice and economic security for all right. of us? Yeah, and let me, I was going to throw that, the next question to you, because um, I know you are thinking some things right now, and you want to say them. Um, and, and as Jackie said, it's not an either or, it's a both and. And one of the things you mentioned, Genesis, was they, the opposition has wanted to shrink government and deregulate. And part of one of the things that the report names is that it's this confluence of both white supremacy and the corporate state, right? And that there is a relationship, that we actually have a shadow state, that our government is a problem, but it might not be even the problem. It's growing it comes up, bumps up against this shadow state, this corporate state that has so much power. So as an organizer who doesn't want to play by the rules, who uh, wants to change the rules of the game so that we can, so that Jackie can do more and Genesee can do more and there's more space in media. Um, how do you, I know you all support solidarity economy, community land trust, worker co-ops as alternatives as well as growing the public. How do you organize with people who are living the day-to-day -day realities that Genesee described mm -hmm. um, towards something more transformative and talk about things like what we're doing today in our small spaces can get us to a larger new social contract. Of course. You know, I want to go back to that doesn't want to play by the rules. I want everyone to under understand. <laughs> so I'm like, my gosh, doesn't want to play by the rules. And you know, and, and, quote, and, and, and it goes back, it actually goes back to what you talked about, right? When the new social, con the, 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 the social contract was being developed and crafted, you know, back in, you know, back in the day, back in the Great Depression, um, back during Jim Crow. Um, what folks had to do was they had to engage in mutual aid. That wasn't playing by the rules, right? What they had to do is they had to make sure that if I have a business, that I co co do it in cooperative with other African Americans who could not get jobs in other businesses, that I had to hire those who were most marginalized. That wasn't playing by the rules. To register to vote wasn't playing by the rules. Genesis is not playing by the rules by running for office. Jackie's not playing by the rules by saying, we need to hear the people's voices first. And so this is what I mean by that. And so at Black Women's Blueprint, when we engage in mutual aid, when we engage in those practices like uh, um, the quilting bee, the women of the quilting bee, how many of you heard of the quilting, the quilting bee? Uh, the quilting bee during the Great Depression, um, when uh, um, you know, housing grants were being given out, when land grants, 
um, were being given out. These were a group of women sharecroppers who were living on some big rich farmer, you know, farmer's land and they were, you know, sharecroppers pretty much. Um, and when the sharecropper discovered that they had been, well first, one thing, underground, right? They were doing their thing, they were quilting, creating beautiful quilts and they were selling those quilts. And they sold so many quilts on their own without the farmer knowing that they were able to buy 23 acres of their own land from that money that they, used, that they made from quilting and selling those quilts. So when the farmer found out that they weren't playing by the rules, you know what he did? He said, get off my land. You have time on your hands to quilt and sell quilts and make money and not tell me about it and not give me a share? Get off my land, thinking they were gonna be on the streets. You know what they did? They took their quilts and they moved to their 23 acres because they didn't need that anymore. And so that's part of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that is more comprehensive, something that brings into and that speaks to the inclusivity that you, that you Jackie, and that you, Genesis, are talking about, right? Inclusivity meaning that what we do at the community level and what we do at the grassroots level around solidarity economy, around uh, uh, mutual aid, around quilting bees, around land shares, around housing shares, around barter networks, that those things are also valuable, that those things are also considered viable and fundable and sustainable for our communities. And so these are part of the solutions that have existed since, you know, <laughs> since the original, uh, for actually forever. That's right. And they, these solutions Help to uh, help our communities to survive, and to survive again. Not only the Jim Crow era, but an era where voter suppression, voter suppression, forget it. You couldn't, you know, you could, you could be killed, you know, for voting. And so we're living in a time right now where the economic system is, it hasn't worked for us. Historically, it hasn't worked for us. It didn't work for us when I showed up here in the 1980s, you know, and it still doesn't. And so those solutions that we're talking about. Is, the sol is solidarity economy and new economies that value people over profit, that don't necessarily depend on big corporations, but that, okay, maybe a, that philanthropy can support, that organizations can support, that progressive um, and, and, and uh, um, candidates that believe, believe in liberation, that are from the people, that are about the people, can also support. So that's what you know we're we're doing in terms of just thinking about thinking outside of the, this this usual this capitalist box. Right. You know, and as you're saying this, I'm thinking social media, social media, social media too. Um, how do we take the technology, the new technology, and and how does that overlay with community when indeed community can be so much broader now? It, it's it's even it's global. The connection you know, that I can have to somebody back home in Jamaica, to somebody in Ghana, you know, it's just phenomenal that these connections, when you think of January 2017 and what was going to be a women's march in the United States became a global movement that nobody could have predicted. And so, you know, I think you're, you're, you're right on, but it's the idea of how do we take these things um, these community um, engagement partnerships and move them to scale where we have impact on millions of people and shift lives wholesale, right? Um, I think that's, that's for me when I think about it and, and the value of communication, the value of telling the story because that story you told isn't known and it hasn't seeped into every community of color in such a way that we can own it and build on it. Can and so, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, just to jump in on social media, I mean, so I'm always the person that comes and poo-poos on certain things. But the, what, what has happened w w that we know with social media, particularly Facebook, we know, is that Facebook is suppressing um, particular ideas. And, you know, we hear it, I, I get sort of reports every day, I see people who complain about it. Um, you know, Center for Media Justice has written letters to Facebook. Um, we know about black identity extremists, we know about the surveillance on social media. So, but, 
that said, social media is still um, a way to break out of the silos that we're talking about and connect people. One of the ideas that I'm always running in my head is about defense. I think part of the reason why it's so scary to run for things or it's so scary to participate is because we don't think that we can, we can defend ourselves when the system acts the way the system acts. And so I'm not saying what kind of defense, I'm just saying that we need to be prepared and we need to let people know that we have their back and that they can't be disappeared. It's not just about groups of people who believe, it's about people who know the system and know how to beat it back. And you know, like for me, like it's not easy. You know, I'm a black woman in media, right? Like I used to work at women's magazines. I was screaming in a fan, I was screaming in the wind. Knowing that people had my back that were strategic and knowing that we actually had the strategy and the power to counter some of what was happening is the thing that gives people confidence to actually move forward with the bigger ideas about what's right. So stepping into the space, having each other's back, figuring out how to scale a solidarity economy, right? Moving from government, corporate partnerships, these private public to maybe government community partnerships to rethink how we organize ourselves. Now, that's more or less what we're talking about. And one of the reasons, and we're gonna turn it to you now, one of the reasons that we are talking about a new social contract is because we are actually not the only ones. And I'm not talking about community. World Economic Forum is putting out a report on what kind of a new social contract we should have. Davos. Um, corporate sectors are already talking about the change they see coming inevitably. Um, and if we don't talk about it, mm -hmm. we won't have the counter narrative. We won't have, this, we won't have the ideas to step into the space or feel the need, and we won't have the vision to organize. And that's why we're talking about it here. Now normally, what's supposed to happen now in all these uh, types of events is you're supposed to get to ask questions. But Farah, Ara has her own way of doing things. Um, so she said, well, I wanna hear from the audience. I said, well, there's gonna be a lot of people in the audience. So we came up with uh, uh, a device to, to hear from you all because we do wanna commit to making this a mutual learning space and learn from many of you here. We're going to ask you to pick one person that you're sitting near and to exchange some thoughts very briefly on whether you think we need a new social contract and if you, you do when you're here, so you probably need, that could be a short conversation. And if you do, what would be for you one of the top line sort of priorities or ideas or strategies that move us in that direction from where we are now at this moment of extreme instability and equity and uh, pretty much dismantling of even the minimal protection we had to a place where we could revision and rethink how we organize ourselves. So I'm gonna ask you to pick somebody. I'm not gonna say pick someone you don't know or you do know, that's entirely up to you. And I'm gonna give you a few minutes and then when you're done, we're gonna ask people to come to the mic not to share their own thoughts, but the, maybe a thought they heard from someone else they think is worth sharing. Take your, take your three, three to five minutes, yeah. Two minutes. Okay. We'll give you about two you minutes. You got two minutes to share an idea. <laughs> yeah. You heard the question, right? Color what? Color lines. Color lines is for females, so we don't have a lot of people. So it looks like a big organization. I know. I, I get the... Yeah, you get the... Race forward is a good organization, color lines is not. So one thing I want to do is I want to talk to um, people who are insurgent candidates who might not necessarily have the value of, you know, where you're sitting on the social Because, you know, there's a lot of folks excited on the Democratic Party, national yeah. politics in the Democratic Party. And there's also a lot of discussion around the I know, we're looking at each other. Yeah. But I think, you know, because yeah. women running on a hyper-local level is also a trend that's not receiving a lot of attention. And I'm just interested in, like, 
I'm, I'm interested in people like you and like what your takeaways are. Um, how you got involved in it in the first place, and then how people who are readers can support you because I do think that you know I can imagine that. Let me just say it's also for me. I have been you know, to the with um, Harry Belafonte, Melissa Harris Perry, and Monica Hoffman. Standing room only so on a Friday you know, night, young people. Yeah. I, just, I couldn't believe it. So right. I'm not like I'm a, just saying. Like our name is for somebody, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but talk. I mean, that's the point. Like, I think, I, I think the idea of being a speech person, got, like, over I know, is coming out more because everybody's a speech person, and it's hard to actually, like, Okay. They seem... I'm going to call her out on the mic. <laughs> somebody calling you out, like a pundit calling you out and defeating your argument and all the rest of that. What you're talking about is like basic accountability. Like you need to show your face and your name. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? All right, I'm almost sorry to interrupt. There's a lot of animated... Uh, I don't know how to make them stop. So if we could come back. <laughs> that was good. We're going to come back now. I don't want to play by the rules. And hear your thoughts. All right. Face forward. Thank All right. you. Who wants to who wants to start? Mics are back there. Yeah, so you can head towards the back of the room. There are two microphones. But so it's being live streamed. So the best way for the people on live stream who are watching online to hear you is to go to the microphone. And you can start a line at the microphone as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for this. Um, we were talking in our little group, and one question, unfortunately we didn't read the white paper before we got here. Could you sort of highlight what the main points of the new social contract are, just so that as a room we're more so informed? Sure, I'd, I'd, I, would be, I would be happy to. So the, what, the, what the paper did was look at what are the solutions that communities have been advancing around the country, right? Communities that are sort of at the front lines of injustice. Which ones are most transformational and what do they add up to? And, and we started by asking ourselves, how did we get here? Because I'm sure most of us never expected to be in a place this bad right now. Well, some did. I think some people predicted it, but, but uh, how did we even get here? What were the fault lines that allowed the political situation to develop to where it is right now. And we looked at the sort of systems that we had in place and the ideas in the 20th century that led to it, and we realized that the fault lines really were designed around creating racial exclusion and gender dependence. And it was through those fault lines that capital was protected, the private was for certain people, Good jobs were for certain people, you know, and there's a couple of dozen pages in the report that goes over the details, but it's, a, it's examples include who got excluded from labor protection, domestic workers, farm workers, all black and Latinx, um, who was denied at the, at the welfare offices at first, it was black women. Our offices simply weren't set up where black women lived. Um, what do the jobs programs go to? They were designed for men and mostly white men. So you could see the list is quite long. And so, we, so then we looked at, well, what are the solutions to this mess we've gotten ourselves into and who has them? And what we noticed was that the best and boldest and most effective solutions did have a few things in common. One, even though they were coming out of communities that were quite marginalized, they were actually solutions that worked for everyone. They were solutions that met the needs of everyone. They were universal in their application, but they were equitable in their design. Second, they were guided by values, not profit. Communities that came together that created the most effective solutions work through principle. And third, they were driven by more participatory forms of democracy and building power. We looked at five sectors, public goods, and we gave examples like the universal healthcare movement, the call for universal basic income, 
the call for for universal care, elder care, child care, creating a caring economy, and how we get there through rethinking our taxation entirely. These are structural issues, but they are racialized and gendered in their application. The new tax bill was one of the greatest, worst um, civil rights moments in our history, if you look at the impacts. We also looked at land, energy, housing. Who owns it? How does it work? It's incredibly speculative. We have huge corporations buying a house today, or lots of property today, doing nothing to add value and selling it at a profit. That's gambling, that's speculation. That's not investment, that's not building an economy. And there are 200 community land trusts across the country where community owns the land, and individuals and families own the homes, but if you resell it, you only resell it to somebody who could also afford it. They're permanently affordable. It's not about speculation, it's about community. It's community control green energy is another example. The third category we looked at was finance and banking, something we don't think enough about. Uh, but there is a public bank movement across the country, and in public banks, municipalities would put their money, it would get reinvested into community, not into gentrification, uh, if we had candidates of the right caliber, and not into speculation. Um, they, Nor North Dakota has a public bank for 100 years. It's worked wonderfully. We also looked at labor, so much around labor. Federal jobs guarantee would be one of the greatest racial equity booms um, in quite a while if we were able to get it, and it's actually a conversation that's happening out there. Worker co-ops growing the solidarity economy, and also there are worker-driven forms of enforcement like the Fair Food Program in Florida is the example we gave, where workers actually run the enforcement systems to protect their own rights. And finally, democracy as the other sector we looked at. Participatory budgeting, community land trusts are democratic, workplace democracy, transparency that you mentioned. How can we be democratic if we're not transparent? Changing the culture of schools through restorative justice where parents and students have a uh, participate in how discipline, for example, is decided. So these are the types of solutions, and we believe it does add up to a new model that if you scaled them, as Jackie said, we would move away from a corporate state to a state that was grounded in community, in democracy, and in meeting people's needs rather than speculation and concentration of profit. So that's the report. See, now you don't have to read it. But no, if you do, actually, it would be great. Uh, and and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So as a reader, there's something I also want to mention, and that is in the report, you break down these various instruments that communities are using, but you also have a factor in there where you talk about how to scale up. And so I think that that was a really essential part of the report because people often see community-driven things as too small and they don't understand how they can expand. So. Yay for the report. I just wanted to add that. There's a scale up part in the report. That, you know. it, it, there's a part imagining what it would be to scale up every one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what would that do to our world? Um, and let us imagine that. And I'm going to push back also, because here's the one thing. The current system won't seed as easily. So I didn't get to finish the report. But we got to talk about, which is what you said earlier, how do we respond when we try to create this progressive change and we are met with resistance? Because the resistance is on the other side too. And I think that's the challenge. So let's go back to the mics. Maybe this mic now. Hi, my name is Dorcas Davis. Nice to meet you. Hi, Farrah. <laughs> um, I would like you all to talk a little bit about, um, and I'll just tell you what my experience was with um, dealing in community with white supremacy um, in particular. Um, last year with Farah, um, we did the March for Racial Justice and the March for Black Women. We came together, and part of organizing the March for Racial Justice was being in different communities and talking to different communities. And being in conversation with different communities, the trauma, and impact of white supremacy was so immense. And at the same time, there was a siloed experience or belief or presumption of belief that um, my, as a black woman coming into another community, 
are you, why, why are you here asking us about us? And it was a disbelief around genuine interest and commitment to saying, okay, no, 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 we can, we can do this. We can, we can bring this thing down. We need to, to come to the table together and do it. There was a genuine disbelief because that has been a historical pattern and being competed, that is part of our experiences in this country. That is part of the impediments to a social contract, when you live in a social construct that is dehumanizing and pits people against each other and is competitive and tells you, you can gain status over another person if you act like this and conform and align to white supremacy. So when we talk about a new social contract, how are we addressing that trauma? How are we addressing the lack of trust in building a social contract together and saying, I am going to place a new standard on human rights in your life when no standard exists right now. You could be poor, you can be shot in the street, you can be unarmed and it can happen and it'll be okay here. How do, I, how do we set a standard that doesn't exist but also, and also addresses the traumas that we are living under so we are off the survival, um, like, wheel that like impedes people from reaching out and, and caring when they want to care or showing care when they want to care. So what's your answer? Because we asked for answers. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a big lesson for me was being in conversation, creating the space for conversation and transformative conversation. I've sat in rooms with people who had literally had never heard of some of the tactics that were happening and are happening in other communities that mirror tactics that are happening in black communities and Latinx communities and indigenous communities, right? So these tactics are very similar. There are a myriad of ways that communities have addressed these things and sometimes being at the table together, being in a room together, you come up with innovative things that can happen. Um, I've seen communities that have transformed their entire neighborhoods through grant writing, funding, to build uh, new complexes without gentrification and just housing their people in there and saying, we're gonna prioritize our people and making sure they have safe housing and it's clean and it's new because you deserve it and it's the standard we have for our community. So that's some of the things that I've seen, but I also wanna hear. <laughs> Go over there. Hi, my name is Helen Higginbotham. Hi, Farah. Um, I haven't read the, con the social contract, um, but I want to say that any social contract that we would have, um, we should be following the model of black women. I, wrote, I made this t-shirt. We are the 96% black women who were too smart to vote for Trump. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> The back of it says, I'm a black woman and my vote counts. And we can't, and I sell them, so if you want one, let me know. <laughs> but the point that I want to make with the t-shirt and just with our voice, um, black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party. There is no winning a national election without us. Um, we have allowed for too long for our vote and our voice to be silenced. And if there's anything that we should learn through what's happening to us right now and where we can go in the future and when we look around at what's happening, we are the future. So we need to leverage our votes. I would hope that any collaboration between black women and any other woman does not drown us out because that happens far too often. People are standing on our shoulders um, and using our voice and we're just at the table, and before you know it, we're excluded from the table. So I would just say any contract that we would have should be inclusive, it should be welcoming, and um, as black women, you demand that you have respect at that table or you get up from that table. Don't allow your voice or your face to be shown at that table. Don't show up at protests unless your voice is heard and respected at that table. And don't ever compromise who you are. And that's the only contract that I'm interested in. <laughs> can, I, can I say something about that really quickly? 
I mean, I think that there are ongoing conversations about anti-blackness and misogynoir. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I, but but I think I think that that's a step that needs to be worked into our development, right? Where you actually have conversations about the very thing that you're talking about, because yes, there are communities that think that the path is to assimilate, and to assimilate is to be anti-black and to be anti-black woman, and so it gets it, for me it gets kind of sticky sometimes because you're trying to have a common language, but there might be an elephant in the room. And so I think that that does need to be a part of any sort of cross-racial or any sort of cross-ethnic discussion, that that can be on the table. Because if it's not, then everybody's going to divest from the table and everybody's going to go back to their corner and we're all going to have the little bit of power that we have right now. But we have to be careful as black, the black boys because there's something that's when we are advocating for ourselves, it is always received as to the exclusion of someone else. And we are the only community that that happens to. And I'm gonna say black Americans specifically, it happens to us. We have a voice and just because we're, you know everybody else can advocate for themselves and it's okay. But when we do it, everybody notices, people have, but we're bad ourselves because we don't take care of each other. If you, if you get a job, you know, and you have the, I, I'm a director of affirmative action right now at a college that did a national recruit for a provost. They got 400 resumes. They interviewed not one black, brown, or yellow person. Everybody they interviewed was white. So I am a director and supposed to accept that. I do not accept that. I will not be quiet about it. So for those of us who get a seat at the table, speak up or get the hell up. <laughs> okay, anyone else? We've got hi, um, one more person. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm Alexis. And uh, in our group, from my perspective, I was thinking of it from like, perspective of an 18 year old because I was just in awe of everything that Genesis was talking about and quite frankly I was quite frankly just confused <laughs> by the entire process that has to do with government and voting and even last week was like the first time I've ever voted in my life and I was utterly confused thank you <laughs> but I was utterly confused I was standing around not knowing what to do I was like do we give this paper back where, where do I go you know and it was just disturbing to me that this type, this, this process is the bedrock of our nation and yet we don't teach it to young people. Why is it that I have to do in-depth research or you know, apply to some organization that can help me be literate in this process? Why is it that I'm only learning how to vote now when I'm literally given the opportunity to at 18 but I'm not learning this in first grade when this is literally the foundation of our society. I don't understand. I don't get it. All right, so let's, I don't see anyone else in no. the mic. Let's take a, a round of sort of reflections on that and anything else I uh, all wanna share. I, I think you make an excellent point. Um, and you know, we, our schools are critical in this process. Um, remember, now you know, but there's a board of education. Go visit the website. Here is the thing. The system is imperfect, and we have to take responsibility to drive the change. And that sucks. Um, you know, I, I'm just gonna take it a bit off. I, I, I watched the tape with Vina, not Vina, Serena the other day. And what caused me most pain was that she kept saying, this is not fair, just over and over. And it made me reflect as 50 something that I never expect it to be fair. Me neither. Which is also sad, okay? So I think part of the discussion here today, and you're absolutely right, you should have been informed at school you weren't, and for that, we owe you beyond an apology. But now you know, and one of the things that's going to be critical is how you take the responsibility to ensure that others know. 
That's what we have to talk about. This new social contract is us putting ourselves front and center to drive the change. It isn't fair. Unfortunately, I don't ever expect it to be fair. But Harriet Tubman did it. Sojourner Truth did it. Fannie Lou Hamer did it. Mm -hmm. Guys, we are being called to be those women today. And that's the charge for us. And we've got to take that really seriously. Okay? It's your moment to be the heroine of the story. And we should just go for it. Um, I think we, I, I completely understand what you're talking about because it happened in many of my poll sites. People were con confused. Some people were asking, hey, I, well, I, I came in to vote for you. I didn't see your name. And they didn't understand that that side of the blog was not on the district or whatever. The different, different, different issues. People were confused. And not just juved, but people who have voted before. And that was that, that's sad, unfortunately. But um, we are the new wave, right? So I think we now need to take the our new ideas and convert into convert that into the new conven conventional wisdom. Uh, conventional wisdom is is uh, the popular expressions of values, belief, and it dictates dictates who are the losers and who are the winners. Um, and right now, that conventional wisdom says that we are the losers, uh, that, that, or that we are not the one in favor, or, you know, and, and, and that affects people's psyches, you know, and, and allow them to say, okay, uh, whatever. This is not our, this is like my parents sometimes. They say, ah, this is not our country. And I'm like, what do you mean this is not your country? You've been here for like 20 years. <laughs> this is, you're not going back to the R. So this, <laughs> So this is your country. So I, I think we need to take ownership uh, of, of this, regardless if you are an immigrant or not, you know? I see the same thing with African-Americans in my district or the Chinese, you know? And we don't think that we belong there, that we are part of it. And a lot of, you know, maybe that's why my grandfather never bought a house, you know? All my family live on the same, almost on the same blocks, on the 50s. And I always think about, like two years ago, I was having a conversation with my grandma. How come we never, we could have bought a building and have each body on each floor? That's what the Chinese do. I, I was telling her. Um, and the Jewish people, they do that. We could have done the same thing, you know? And, and, but it is, is that we are not, at least as a, name, as a Dominican immigrant, right? I, I think about how my people always think, oh, this is not our country, or uh, we're going to get this place anyways. Or, and then it happens, you know? Now we, we're facing rezoning in which we're not being in a lot of neighborhoods, we're not being part of it. Um, and that needs to change, you know? And it has changed in some neighborhoods. Like in Sunset Park, we have a rezoning plan coming up. But we also have a plan by the people, right? And that, that is what needs to be replicated, because it's there. We already, have, um, we already have it. We already have the answers. We just need to, to dismantle all ideas and, and convert that into all stuff, you know? Because if we look at the polls, we look at the research, we learned that, unlike many, a well, few years ago, that uh, increasing the, the wage is not going to, to worsen the economy. Uh, making, having more funding for public education is not going to be a burden on, you know, on the local government. Um, Health care, you know, we have Obamacare. It's not the best thing, but it, you know, people thought it was going to be a disaster. It, it's not. We're still here. Um, so. <laughs> That, you know, that, that's what we need to continue uh, repeating. No, it does work. It does work, and, you know? And I, I always think about the Black, the, the black Panthers, right? Uh, we have breakfast in public education today in New York City because of the Black Panthers, mm -hmm. right? Um, they started it. They, they, they asked nobody for permission. And that was something, you know, that was a new social construct, and we have it today, and I think, we, we have participatory budgeting, we're talking about it. In Brazil, they have the whole city, I think, right? The whole, the whole region. Yeah. The whole, yeah, regions. Here, we, we have some council districts having it. But some, even, some people don't even know about, about participatory budgeting. So we just need to repeat that. Repeat what is working and repeat that it's coming from us. Uh, yeah.
and one more from the door. Oh, from the is line. there someone? I didn't see more people at the mic. Go. Oh. Yeah. I just came up. Um, okay. I Surprise. wanted to hear a bit about what the social contract would suggest for mental health services for women of color, because just hearing all of this is emotionally exhausting. And women of color carry the entire emotional labor of this nation because our oppressors will not liberate us. So we have to do our work, their work, and the work of everyone else. So I, if you have any advice on this, I would love to hear it. I know that I have a job that has a lot of benefits, but mental health services aren't one of them. And I can only imagine all the other women that have no idea how to go about getting access. I think the overall argument, which would address this as, as well as many other issues, is that we have more than enough resources. We know this. It's a question of how we're using them, right? So as you said, Obamacare happened. We're still here. It's not perfect. We can afford universal health care. We know that. We know, in fact, people would save money if we had universal health care. And if it were comprehensive and inclusive and equitable, of course it would include mental health, not only for women of color, but for everyone. Um, and these should not be the margins on which we are arguing, right? This should be a given. And I think that is, is part of why we want to have these conversations. We shouldn't be having big fights for this care or that care or these needs or that needs. We need to be talking about what are the containers, what are the structures that are causing us to have to fight issue by issue, community by community. Because it's not necessary. It is a political decision. When you look at our tax structure, how we use money, how much money is in the speculative economy, how much money is in the financial sector that's not being used to anything that helps anyone. The question we have to ask ourselves is why are we in a country that, in a world, that's allowed our, this financialization where we move money to make money rather than use money to meet needs? And so all of these issues, and what I'll, I'll give you, a, it's a different kind of example, but it's, to me it was a light bulb. Working with farm workers in the southeast corridor of Florida and up the coast, um, they had extremely difficult circumstances back in the 90s. They was, that was so bad that there was uh, case after case of slavery being prosecuted by the feds uh, with, uh, with sentences of up to 30 years and upwards of 1,800 people um, were liberated from slave camps in Florida agriculture alone. So that gives you an idea of the conditions. They pushed for a campaign that changed the structure of the industry. It didn't look just at slavery. It didn't look just at rape. It didn't look just at wage theft. It looked at power relations. And they created these contracts between the farm workers and the corporations at the top who had power to make the change. Because they found that no matter how awful the subcontractors or the growers were, the real power to make the change was at the top. Now fast forward, one of the most fascinating outcomes is that it has become one of the most effective programs not only to prevent slavery, but to prevent sexual abuse and rape and harassment in the fields. There's nothing like it. If they had tried just to prevent sexual abuse, harassment, and rape, they would not have succeeded. They could not have addressed just that issue. They had to address the power relations. And I think that's the, the urging I would have for people. Let's think structurally. Let's think bigger than our issues, no matter how important they are, because we're not going to fix them issue by issue. We need to think about a realignment. And we have I'll one let, final question. Oh, there's another yeah. one. Okay. All right. We got, we're, we're kind of out of time, but hurry up. <laughs> Hello. Um, I actually did want to ask um, this panel or, or to raise the topic explicitly of sexual violence. Um, I'm a doctoral student and I focus specifically on sexual violence within marginalized communities. And one thing I'll say is that this country was literally born out of rape literally, and it keeps replicating itself over and over and over and over again to the point in which 
black and Latinx, and Latinx women cannot report rape to the police officers for fear that the police officers will then rape them. And it happens so often. Um, and, I, and I know you talked about not focusing on a specific issue, but if you look at sexual violence and the unchecked trauma that stems from it, it has an effect on how people can even relate to other people. It has an effect on how people can parent their children. It has an effect on whether or not they can even go to work and earn the wages that keep the lights on, because if you're struggling with PTSD, but you're poor and you live in the South Bronx, no one's gonna give you a day off of work or a week off of work or a month or however long it takes. Um, sexual violence is something that we know is about power and therefore it, it is inherently political. Um, and it, it is an issue that deserves our focus, not just from a political lens, but as I mentioned before, from an economic lens, from a criminal justice lens, there's so many black and brown folks, not even just women who are being raped in prison with no access to justice at all. It is destroying our communities because it's destroying the very fiber of who we are as individuals. How do we tackle this issue? How do we check this trauma so that we can actually be individuals and form communities who are fully realized and not dealing with repeated post-traumatic stress disorder from the violation of our bodily autonomy. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I hear you. <laughs> I, I hear you 100%. And right now what we're facing with the federal government is the reauthorization of VAWA, right? This issue with the reauthorization of VAWA. And of course, we're going to laws, right? So we can talk about laws and we can talk about policies, but look at this, right? Survivors are sitting and they're waiting. They're making survivors wait. When the, the Violence Against Women Act expires on September 30th, what they've done is, is they've decided that, you know, we're gonna postpone it till uh, uh, the midterms are done, right? So they're playing with our very lives, you're right. They're playing with our lives, they're playing with our mental health, they're playing with even our capacity to be able to get out of bed and vote. Right? So that's, that's at the government level. But then when we think about this, this, this uh, a new social contract that makes certain demands of our governments, right? Whether it's local or, or, or federal governments, I envision a social contract that also makes certain demands of our communities. I'm talking R. Kelly and all of us who are supporting him. Right? I'm talking about that because that also perpetuates not only additional sexual violence, but it continues to perpetuate and sustain these conditions that we live under as survivors who are unable to fully participate in, this, in democracy, fully participate even in the basic life of their families and of their communities. So that's one answer that I'll give to that. But when it comes to what is written in the white paper, as some folks have called it, in the report, Kathy, that is also a question that we have, you know, as a sexual violence prevention, you know, organization that looks at the work at the intersection of um, criminal justice and economic justice. How, how do you answer that? Well, I don't, wouldn't call violence an issue. It's, it's way beyond an issue, right? It's a whole system. It's a, it's a culture. I, I would even go back to the last issue, denying people mental health is a form of violence as well. It's a much broader issue. I would argue that perpetrators rape women, in particular women of, of color, because they can, because there isn't that accountability, because of power relations. And if you look at what are the underlying preventive strategies, yes, we need VAWA and we need accountability, but that's not prevention. If you look at what reduces violence against women, it's higher wages, for example. It doesn't eliminate it, but it does reduce it. And you can see that in, in study after study. It's secure housing and it's political power. Because political power, you know, once you have economic security, once you have social stability, then with political power is where you can ensure the a kind of accountability that leads to prevention. So you can't look at a dynamic like violence, sexual violence, or any kind of violence without, un, without thinking about what are the underlying structures that would change and shift power, um, would be my response. There's so much more to say on that. I feel like there needs to be an entire conversation just on that piece, 
Because when you look at the yeah. spectrum of violence, right, even if you, the spectrum of prevention, right, it's the individual, it's the relational, it's the familial, it's the, it's the communal, it's the societal. It's, and for us at BWB, we push for the structural, which is not part of sort of like the, the generally accepted you know, uh, um, framework. We push for the structural and we also push for a recognition of the historical that continues to feed you know, how black women's bodies are considered and viewed and how we are unrapeable, how we're the Jezebels and the Bammies and all of that, right? So that's not included in the prevention language. It's not included in the frameworks offered. And it's not something that is even included in terms of, you know, certain statutes that require, uh, that, 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 are, that are distributed to us and that we have to follow in terms of, you know, and, and respond to, um, to in, in order to get funding so that we can prevent violence in our own communities. So there's so much more to say about that. That, I think we should have a whole other um, you know, <laughs> event around that. And, and I just wanna add, because there has been, we hope, probably not enough progress, but some progress made in New York City. Uh, you may know that just the other day, the mayor's office to combat domestic violence is now known as the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. And so they're looking at the full spectrum of gender-based violence in the process, including sexual trafficking, including rape, et cetera. But, um, and I think it's, it's really important to know that that shift is underway in this city, which means that the interventions that we deploy will look holistically, and you just laid out a marvelous intersectional systems analysis on it. Um, and that's where government is going to operate now in New York City. We also passed the Paid Safe Leave Act, right? So now, as a part of sick time, if you need time off to address issues of gender-based violence, your time will be paid in New York City. And what I want to say, it is important to recognize the victories you get along the way and to utilize them, or else we'll continue to spin in a deficit model, and that's defeating. And so I just want to say when there is progress, this is why we really want to get to community, to communicate the shifts so that we can increase information and utilization. And I want to go back to early in my remarks, I talked about the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, this global campaign that we are in New York City trying to make local. We want to ensure that between November 25th and December 10th this year and every year moving forward, we can have local community discussions that are solution oriented. How does my community district, every community district, we want to challenge our nonprofit partners to hold at least one event that fosters dialogue around solutions generated by community to address gender-based violence. That's the shift we're talking about because when we can do that, then we document and we inform, and we can replicate. And cities can okay. as well. And, right, the, the, right. So exactly. I think we're, we're, we're not out of time, we're, we're past out of time. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let you close this out, but I want to thank all of you who have joined our conversation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. You'll be having an opportunity. We do close the Schomburg at 9 p.m., but you will have an opportunity to, to approach our panelists as you exit the auditorium. And we want to encourage you to follow the Schomburg Center. You become, can become a member of our Schomburg Society and receive entry into any of our events. Also, follow us on sh social media just to keep up. If you can't physically be here for our programming, we do offer programming online. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>